Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this Saturday marks the first anniversary of the senseless murder of our friend Sir David Amos. David was a superb parliamentarian who brought colleagues across this House together on a huge range of issues. He represented the best of Parliament as a devoted champion of his constituency. Our thoughts are with his wife Julia and his five children, as well as the people of South End, which now stands tall as a city in testament to David's tireless work. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Yeah. I knew uh, Sir David, and I share the Prime Minister's uh, sentiments completely. Uh, spooking the markets and increasing the cost of borrowing and increasing the cost of mortgages uh, was almost certainly an act of gross incompetence <laughs> rather than malevolence. But going back on the commitment uh, to end no-fault evictions is an act of extreme callous callousness. Yes. Yes. Can the Prime Minister reassure the 11 million private renters in this country yes. that she will carry out the commitment to get rid of no fault evictions. Yeah. I can. Julia Sturdy. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On a recent visit to the children's ward at York Hospital, I was shocked to learn that paediatric waiting time targets are the same as that of adult patients. So, As we know, any delay to treatment for young patients can have a damaging effect on development and their future prospects. So, Can I ask the Prime Minister to look at this as a matter of urgency? Well, I am very, very sorry to hear about the situation for young people at York Hospital, and I am pleased to say that this is an issue that my right hon. Friend, the Health Secretary, is focused on. In her plan for patients, we are making sure that people can access treatment as soon as possible. We are delivering record staffing numbers and putting in place record levels of funding. Come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join with the Prime Minister in her comments about Sir David? Uh, she spoke for the whole House when she made those comments, and I know uh, how deeply his loss was felt on the opposite benches, and we extend our best wishes across at this important time. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I also want to send my heartfelt condolences to the families of all those who tragically lost their lives in Chrysler last week. Yeah. Donegal is a special place to me and my family and across this House. Uh, the people there are in all of our thoughts. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this morning the Business Secretary toured the TV studios arguing that the turmoil in the markets has nothing to do with her budget. <laughs> Does the Prime Minister agree with him? Well, Mr Speaker, what we have done is we have taken decisive action. We have taken decisive action to make sure that people are not facing right. energy bills of £6,000 for two years. Remember, the opposition is only talking about six months. Yeah. Yeah. We have also taken decisive action to make sure that we are not facing the highest taxes yeah. for 70 years yeah. in the face of a global economic slowdown. Yeah. And what we are making sure is that we protect our economy at this very difficult time internationally. And as a result, as a result of our action, Mr. Speaker, and this has been independently corroborated, we will see higher growth and lower inflation. Mr. Speaker, avoiding the question, ducking responsibility, lost in denial. No wonder investors have no confidence in her government. And this is why it matters. A few weeks ago, Zach and Rebecca from Wolverhampton were all set to buy their first home. Then the government's borrowing spree sent interest rates spiralling and their mortgage offer was withdrawn. I met them last week. They're back to square one, unable to buy 
devastated, sick to the back teeth with excuses and blame shifting, yeah. does the Prime Minister understand why Zach and Rebecca are completely furious with her? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the fact is that when I came into office, people were facing energy bills of up to £6,000 a year. Speaker, the party opposite are shouting, but he is opposing the very package that we brought in the energy price guarantee. That was the major part of the mini budget that we announced. And Mr. Speaker, he has refused to confirm whether or not he backs our energy price guarantee for two years, which protects families not just this winter but next winter. What we're seeing, Mr Speaker, is we are seeing interest rates rising globally. We are doing they are rising globally in the face of Putin's appalling war in Ukraine. And what we are doing is helping people with lower stamp duty, helping people with their energy costs, reducing inflation with our energy package and keeping taxes low. And I notice that the honourable gentleman had a Damascan conversion last night when he backed our cut to national insurance. Mr Speaker, the economy is in turmoil. People are really worried. This is really not the time to descend into absolutely nonsense attacks about last night. There's no point. There's no point. There's no point trying to hide it. Everyone can see what has happened. The Tories went on a borrowing spree, sending mortgage rates through the roof. They are skyrocketing by £500 a month. And for nearly two million homeowners, their fixed rate deals are coming to an end next year. They're worried sick, and everybody in this House knows it. They won't forgive. They won't forget, and nor should they. No. Yeah. When will she stop ducking responsibility, do the right thing, and reverse her kamikaze budget, which is causing so much pain? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, last night the Labour Party supported. I won't see the Prime Minister. I'm sorry if the wrong party doesn't, but I certainly do. <laughs> I'm just, Mr. Speaker, I'm genuinely unclear yeah. about what yeah. Labour's. Yeah. Yeah. I think we don't want an early bap at this stage. The Rugby World Cup's coming. Don't start it too soon. Just let's hear the questions and certainly the answers, Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm genuinely unclear as to what, as to what the Labour Party's policy is on our energy price guarantee. It was the biggest part, it was the biggest part of our mini budget. Are the opposition saying they want to reverse it and they want to see people facing energy bills of six thousand pounds? Is that what he's saying? Here's Starmer. Mr Speaker, the, the Prime Minister knows very well that on this side we voted against the national insurance in the first place. She, she, she voted for it. So who is doing the U-turn? Honestly, last week the Prime Minister was forced to U-turn on her unfunded tax cut for the super wealthy. This week she's beginning to realise that she needs to extend the windfall tax, yeah. one step behind the CEO of Shell. Yeah. But she's, she's still going ahead with £18 billion of tax cuts for the richest businesses, yeah. and they didn't even ask for it. Yeah. She's still gift-wrapped a stamp duty cut for landlords, just as renters feel the pinch. Mm. And she's still holding out tax cuts for those who live off stocks and shares. Yeah. Why does she expect working people to pick up the bill for her unfunded tax cuts for those at the top? Yeah. Yeah. I notice that the Leader of the Opposition is still not saying whether or not he supports our energy price guarantee. Yeah. This, is, this is very relevant, Mr Speaker, because it is the biggest part it is the biggest part of our mini-budget. It's the biggest part of the mini-budget. 
the fact is that all the opposition have said is that people should be supported for six months. Does he think that in March pensioners should be facing very high energy bills? Because that's what will happen if he doesn't support our energy price guarantee. Mr Speaker, not even attempting to answer the questions now. I gently remind her that the idea of freezing energy bills was a Labour idea which she then took on. During her leadership contest, the Prime Minister said, and I quote her exactly, I'm very clear, I'm not planning public spending reductions. Is she going to stick to that? Absolutely. Absolutely. What we are... Look, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, we are spending... We are spending almost a trillion pounds of public spending. We were spending 700 billion back in 2010. What we will make sure is that over the medium term, the debt is falling. But we will do that not by cutting public spending, but by making sure we spend public money well. And the honourable gentleman talks about our spending, which he doesn't seem to support on the energy price guarantee. But the reality is he can't criticise us on one hand for spending money, on the other hand claiming we're cutting public expenditure. Yes, they can cheer. I hope they listen very, very carefully to that last answer, because other people will listen very, very carefully to it. Who voted... Uh, who voted for this? Who voted for this? Who voted for this? Not homeowners paying an extra 500 extra on their mortgages. Who voted this? Not working people paying for tax cuts to the largest companies. Who voted for this? Not even most of the MPs behind her who know, who know you can't pay for tax cuts on the never never. Does she think does she think the public will ever forgive the Conservative Party if they keep on defending this madness and go ahead with a kamikaze budget? Yeah. Mr Speaker, what our budget has delivered is security, fa- security family- for families for the next two winters. It's made sure that we're going to see higher economic growth lower inflation and more opportunities. The way that we will get our country growing is through more jobs, more growth, more opportunities, not through higher taxes, higher spending and his friends in the union stopping hard-working people get to work. Cheryl Burry. Come on, Cheryl. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to see growth and jobs in East Cornwall and I believe an investment zone could help this. Would the Prime Minister back the Honourable Member for North Cornwall and myself who are supporting a zone for Liscard and Bodmin area? Well, I want to see more jobs, more opportunities, more homes for local people in Cornwall. And I know that's what my Honourable Friend is working towards with her colleagues. And I'm delighted we're bringing forward these investment zones that are going to give those opportunities to local people. We now come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister on the murder of David Amos a a year ago? And thoughts and prayers very much with Julia and and his family. And, of course, uh, we think very much of those in Cressler that have been caught up in the terrible tragedy uh, there as well. I would have hoped that if the Prime Minister is making public spending commitments today, that she would have said that those that rely on social security benefits will get their benefits uprated in line with inflation. Mr Speaker, when the Prime Minister last stood at the dispatch box, the average two-year fixed-rate mortgage stood at 4.5%. They are now at 6.5% and rising, hitting average families with an extra £450 a month of mortgage payments every single month over and above what they were paying. 37 days into the job, this is literally the cost of the Prime Minister's incompetence. It is the price households are paying, and all because of the Chancellor that she chose. Will she now give up her desperate plan 
to save her Chancellor's skin by scapegoating the Governor of the Bank of England. Mr Speaker, the action we have taken has meant that families in Scotland and across the United Kingdom are not facing gargantuan energy bills. And what the Honourable Gentleman and his friends in Scotland could do to help us out is build the nuclear power stations that are going to help our energy security, help us get more gas out of the North Sea to help deliver on a more secure energy future for all of our people. Mr Speaker, if she wants to ask us questions, we can swap places. But, you know, the reality is, Mr Speaker, that the Prime Minister is ignoring the damage of the chaos of the mini-budget. She is worrying about saving the Chancellor's job. But many families are now worried not just about heating their homes, but keeping their homes, yeah, Prime yeah, Minister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The scale of this Tory crisis is frightening. 100,000 households a month are up for mortgage renewals. People can't afford to pay an extra £4,500 a year in interest, and plenty are already falling behind. Yep. The Prime Minister and her Chancellor have completely lost control. The only thing growing under this government are mortgages, rents and bills. Is that what she really meant when she declared herself a pro-growth Prime Minister? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have taken action on helping families heat their homes. And that's been very important. And I would love to see more support on delivering the energy security we need. Interest rates are rising globally. That is a fact. And interest rates are a decision for the Independent Bank of England. But I want to do all I can to help families across Britain. But the way we're going to help them is by delivering economic growth, by making sure we have the jobs and opportunities in Scotland and right across the UK. And what independent forecasters have shown is that following our intervention, economic growth is going to be higher than it would have been That's if right. we hadn't acted. And that is vitally important for the jobs, the opportunities and the livelihoods yeah. and helping make sure people are able to put food on the table. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The way navigation winds through the heart of Guildford and is a much treasured part of our local environment. I welcome the announcement by the DEFRA Secretary last week that the Environment Agency will be able to increase fines on water companies for serious breaches of the rules to up to £250 million pounds per breach. Will my right honourable friend confirm that no MP voted to discharge sewage into our waterways and that it is beneath the opposition parties and their activists to keep repeating this outright lie? Well, well, my honourable friend is absolutely right about our support for cleaner water. And what we're doing about it, which the honourable lady has asked from a sedentary position, is we have increased, and my honourable fr- right honourable friend, the DEFRA Secretary, has increased the fines for water companies a hundred times yeah. Yeah, yeah. if they discharge sewage into waterworks in an illegal way. We've acted. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate my colleagues and I with the remarks made about the tragic events in Krishna in County Donegal, and our prayers continue to be with that devastated community. Does the Prime Minister agree with me uh, in welcoming the renewed negotiations with the European Union about the Northern Ireland Protocol, that the outcome of those negotiations must reflect the objectives outlined by the Government in the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, and that this is the key to unlocking the door to political stability in Northern Ireland? Well, uh, I very much agree with the Honourable Gentleman. We need to deliver for the people of Northern Ireland. That means making sure that we have free-flowing trade east-west as well as north-south. It means making sure that the people of Northern Ireland can benefit from the same tax benefits as people in Great Britain. And it means resolving the issues over governance and regulation. Now, I would prefer to achieve that through a negotiated solution with the EU. But if we're not able to do that, we can't allow the situation to drift. We have to proceed with the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. Mary Robinson. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Addressing health inequalities is a key part of levelling up, and so I welcome this week's news of £50 million to fund research into health disparities. We know poor health affects not only life expectancy, but also prosperity and more widely economic resilience and growth. Therefore, would my right hon. Friend consider a future expansion of these research schemes to other parts of the North and the Greater Manchester Region to encourage more healthcare research partnerships between our great universities and our local authorities? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my hon. Friend is absolutely right that this health research is vitally important. I know that my right hon. Friend, the Health Secretary, is looking at whether and where the scheme can be expanded, and we will be doing further commissioning rounds to look at that issue. John McNally. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister, you have had a holiday check, I think, in Birmingham, where you are preaching to the choir, although the few MPs appear to be singing, that were there appear to be singing from a different song sheet. Prime Minister, your government is now outrageously flirting with disaster. Financially, and socially. We have just heard the increase in mortgage repayments will dwarf the rise in heating bills. How will the government, how will you cope with the resultant increase in homelessness? Yeah. 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 I am responsible as you, but I am sure the Prime Minister will take that on board. Well, Mr Speaker, what we have done as a government is we have acted decisively yeah. Yeah, yeah. to deal with the very severe energy crisis we are facing. We are facing a severe energy crisis. We are also facing a slowdown in economic growth globally due to Putin's war in Ukraine. And not acting is not an option. Prime Minister, the energy price guarantee is a key part of the growth plan, but too few businesses and households know about it, even if the Labour Party do not support it. Can I urge you to have a nationwide mail-out campaign to communicate what the government is doing to assess people on reduction of energy, and more particularly, have a reduction of energy campaign by the public service, so that we do not go down the route of spending too much on consumption, we reduce the supply? Well, my, my, um, my right hon. Friend is absolutely right, and I know the Energy Secretary is working on a plan to help companies and individuals use energy more efficiently. We are also working on this across government. I was delighted to speak to my friend yesterday, and I hope we will be able to start this going in number 10 straight away. In Labouring. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. During the lockdown, we clapped them, and then we laid wreaths for healthcare staff who had died on the front line. And how quickly our nurses have gone from the country's heroes to this government's villains, offered a derisory 72 pence a week pay rise, and then painted as militants for daring having the audacity for balloting for industrial action for the first time in a century. Prime Minister, claps don't pay the bills, and neither does 72 pence pay rise. Nurses are leaving the NHS and the droves feeling abandoned by this government. Surely, Surely even the Prime Minister agrees that the government has its priorities wrong when unshackling the bonuses of the bankers and at the same time offering the the rise repair rises to our treasured NHS staff. Well, first of all, can I say what a brilliant job our fantastic nurses do across the country. The figures he's quoting are simply wrong. The independent pay review body recommended a £1,400 rise on average, and that is what the government is committed to delivering. Natalie Elphick. Following the loss of 27 lives last winter in the Channel, the UK government offered joint patrols to the French on the beaches. Could my right hon. the Prime Minister confirm that she renewed this offer to President Macron when they met, and further, that there will be no new money, no fresh agreement with the French, unless they agree to joint beach patrols and a joint security crossing uh, across the Channel to bring an end to the small boats crisis for good? Yeah. Well, the, the Home Secretary is committed to 
dealing with this very, very difficult issue of the small boats in the channel. We do need to sort it out. We're committed to legislating and we're also committed to getting an agreement with the French Government. I did discuss it with President Macron last week and the Home Secretary is following up. Owen Thompson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this Friday, Christine Graham, MSP and I are hosting a community drop-in event on the cost of living crisis in, in Gorebridge. This will be a chance for local residents to come and meet with a range of partners to get advice and and guidance on what they can do to help survive the, the current crisis. Could I extend an invite to the Prime Minister to come to this event on Friday so that my constituents could ask her directly what real life experience means to address the cost rises that they are facing and so that she could apologise to them for the disastrous decisions her government are making? Yes. Well, I completely understand that families are struggling and that is why this government acted within a week of coming into office to put in place the energy price guarantee so people aren't facing £6,000 bills. And that's why we reversed the increase in national insurance. That's why we're cutting basic rate tax to make sure families are keeping more of their own money. And we're also making sure that the most vulnerable households get an extra £1,200 of support. I hope he is going to communicate that to his constituents. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I first uh, thank the Prime Minister for her warm words on Sir David Amos, who is sorely missed in this place. Yeah. Yeah. Small and medium-sized enterprises are the lifeblood of our economy, yeah. and I warmly welcome the expansion of the small business threshold. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Does my right honourable friend agree that, the only, that only the Conservative Party is on the side of enterprise with their determination to unleash the full potential of our great country? Well, we understand in the Conservative Party who pays our wages. And it's the people who get up every day and go to work. It's the businesses who set up. Those are the people driving our economy, and we will be unashamedly pro-growth, pro-business and pro-opportunity. Rosie Cooper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituents were absolutely delighted that the fracking application in West Lancashire was withdrawn after a moratorium was declared. Since then, we have not seen any new scientific evidence that indicates fracking would now be safe. So, Despite this, the government have decided to reverse that moratorium, committing to grant fracking licences only in areas that have local consent. So I would be grateful if the Prime Minister would reassure West Lancashire residents, my constituents, and please explain in detail how she will honour her statement that fracking licences None of them will be forced on communities that don't want it. Well, first of all, can I offer my best wishes to the Honourable Lady on her appointment as the Chair of the Mersey Care NHS Trust. I can absolutely assure her and colleagues around the House that fracking will only go ahead in areas where there is local community support. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Two weeks ago, a bomb in Afghanistan killed 35 girls and young women. They were Hazaras from the country's second largest ethnic minority who were being massacred under the Taliban. Today, outside Parliament, Hazaras from across the UK, including from my constituency, are gathering, calling for international support to stop the slaughter. And we're joined here today by representatives of the Hazara Council of Great Britain. Will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, support the Hazaras in, in trying to stop the killings and arrange for her ministers to meet their representatives? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it is extremely concerning what is taking place in Afghanistan, and I'm afraid the reversal of women's rights and women's opportunities. And one of the things we have done is make sure we're restoring the aid budget for women and girls. And I'm sure my friend, the right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, would be very happy to meet the group and discuss further. Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the government's uh, botched budget gave unfunded tax cuts to some of the richest companies, whilst across the country there are hospitals who worry that their roofs might collapse at any moment. 
Hitchinbrook Hospital, Frimley Park Hospital and Queen Elizabeth Hospital in the Prime Minister's own local area. These are just three of a number of hospitals who need together need hundreds of millions of pounds, some of them urgently. So will the Prime Minister promise that every affected hospital will be given the money they need to fix these dangerous roofs in the next 12 months? Yeah. Well, I, I do want to correct the Honourable Lady because what we are doing is simply not putting up corporation tax. It's not a tax cut. We're just not raising corporation tax. And I feel it would be wrong in a time when we are trying to attract investment into our country at a time of global economic slowdown to be raising taxes because it will bring less revenue in. And the way that we are going to get the money to fund our National Health Service the way that we are going to get money to fund our schools is by having a strong economy with companies investing and creating jobs. I fully support this government's growth agenda, Prime Minister. Uh, would she agree with me that this can be achieved whilst also protecting and restoring our precious nature and ecosystems yeah, yeah, yeah. and working with our farmers so that we do meet our legally binding target to restore nature by 2030? I know she understands this. She has precious talk streams in her own constituency. And will she agree that if we get this right, there will be more jobs, skills, opportunities, because every nation in the world depends on its natural environment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my, my honourable friend did a fantastic job promoting the natural environment when she was at DEFRA. We are going to deliver economic growth in an environmentally friendly way. What this is about is about improving the processes and deliver better outcomes both for the environment whilst making sure we have a growing economy as well. And those two things go hand in hand. Mothers. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister wants us to believe that fracking will reduce our energy bills, but it was not so long ago that her Chancellor said that those calling for fracking's return misunderstand the situation and that no amount of shale gas would be enough to lower the European price any time soon. So, Prime Minister, is the Chancellor wrong about that? Right, Justin. We are pulling every lever to improve our energy supply in Britain, whether it's whether it's the North Sea and opening up more opportunity there, which the opposition front venture against, whether it's fracking, whether it's more renewables, which I'm very supportive of, whether it's more solar panels in the right place, whether it's more nuclear power stations, which are opposed by the SNP. We are doing everything we can because we can never be in a situation again where we are dependent on authoritarian regimes for our energy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Over the past week, serious safeguarding failures by the children's charity Mermaids have come to light. Revelations that the charity sent breast-flattening devices to young girls behind their parents' back, promoted harmful medical and surgical procedures to children, hired a trustee with links to paedophile organisations, and a digital, education, sorry, a digital engagement manager who posted pornographic images online, including of himself dressed as a schoolgirl. For years, despite whistleblowers raising alarm, mermaids have had unfettered access to vulnerable children. Does my right honourable friend agree that it has taken far too long for these concerns to be taken seriously? And does she also agree that it is high time for a police investigation into the activities of mermaids and its staff? It's very important that under-18s are able to develop their own decision-making capabilities and not be uh, forced into any kind of activity. And what I would say on the subject of the investigation she raises, of course those matters should be raised and should be properly looked at. Sir Alby. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. For my constituents in Richmond Park and for communities across South West London, from Wimbledon to Elmbridge, any expansion of Heathrow would be disastrous. A third runway would see over six million more tonnes of carbon pumped into the atmosphere every year and two million households affected by increased noise levels. Last week, the Transport Secretary said she supported Heathrow expansion. The Prime Minister has previously stated she would support a fourth runway. So, does the Prime Minister stand by her previous comments, or will she rule out government support for construction of a third runway at Heathrow? 
Well, I, I absolutely agree with what the Transport Secretary said in her comments. And what we need to do is make sure that industries like the air industry become more environmentally friendly. You know, I support the development of low carbon, low carbon technology in those sectors. That's the way we will help grow the economy but also serve the environment. Virginia Crosby. Thank you. And I'm delighted to hear the Prime Minister uh, be such a champion for nuclear. Um, my question is, when will the mission and plan for Great British <laughs> Nuclear be announced? The market needs the confidence to invest in, nuclear, in new nuclear, like Wilbur in my constituency of Arnesmore, to help us achieve net zero for our energy security and to get thousands of high-quality jobs. Yeah. Well, I can tell my honourable friend that Great British Nuclear will be set up this year and it will be bringing forward new nuclear projects. I'm delighted about her support for Wilfer and to make sure that we have nuclear power provided in Wales. I'd just like to see it right across the United Kingdom too. Matt Weston. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I welcome her to her place. Um, I'm not sure how you measure a good honeymoon, Mr Speaker. (laughs) After five weeks of a crisis conceived in Downing Street, of crashing pensions, interest rates rising, mortgage market turmoil and complete financial chaos, the country has been left wanting divorce. In two recent polls, 60% of this country want an immediate general election. The Prime Minister claims she's in listening mode. Will she give way to the public? Mr Speaker, I think the last thing we need is a general election. That concludes Prime Minister's questions. Let the people leave.